Howdy, everybody. Happy Saturday morning. I hope you have watched your cartoons and have a belly full of sugary cereal. Because uh, right now you're about to listen to our episode on aphrodisiacs from March 12th, 2009. That's right, everyone. Uh, lock the kids away. Don't let them hear. Because this one's all about uh, food and drink that makes you, uh, what do the British say? Randy? I believe so. So please to enjoy, everyone. Aphrodisiacs right now. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Chuck Bryant. Welcome yourself, buddy. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, Chuck. Sure. That felt pretty good, actually. Did it? Just try it. Try it. Welcome yourself. Uh, Welcome, Chuck. How do you feel? Relaxed. Good. Good. Yeah, it has a nice effect. It does. You know what uh, doesn't have a nice effect? Uh, it depends on what you're talking about. Okay, well, I'll just tell you. Okay. Spanish fly. But it turns out, I did, did a little research on this, um, uh, I uh, found out that Spanish fly is not even a fly. It's a type of beetle. True. And uh, the active ingredient, it's actually crushed up, dried and crushed up beetles. Powdered, correct? Sure. It's a powder. And the, the reason they, they powder the beetles is because they're trying to get to this, um, this acid that the beetle emits when it's... Um, it, scared, right? When it's it's threatened, and uh, this acid actually, you know, has long been thought to uh, create amorousness in people. But um, that's bunk, correct? I can tell you the reason they they uh, they thought they were aroused. They were actually confusing uh, urogenital tract irritation. Uh, this stuff actually burns from the inside out. Wow. Yeah, and it can actually uh, cause kidney damage, and I think convulsions and death. No Spanish fly. You should never take this for any reason. No. So, uh, of course, you know, as, uh, as you know, I, I, I like to do lots of research. It's like my thing. It is. Right? Um, I started researching aphrodisiacs in general. True. And here we are at this podcast. Nice intro there. Thank you. Uh, I believe the word comes from the Greek goddess of love, Aphrodite. Is that right? Yeah. That's what I hear? Sure. And an aphrodisiac, uh, by definition, is an element that evokes... Or stimulates uh, sexual desire. Yeah, we should probably make the distinction because I think a lot of people think aphrodisiacs um, are, are a performance, sexual performance enhancing compound or whatever. Right, right, not true at all. Like a Viagra would definitely not be considered an aphrodisiac. No, no. So, uh, nor would Spanish fly, right? Correct. Well, let's talk about sexual arousal, Chuck. Okay. All right, let's just keep it cool, Chuck. If I had a dime for every time you told me that, I wouldn't <laughs> well, be doing Keep it cool, or let's talk about <laughs> sexual arousal. Keeping cool. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, so, uh, medically speaking, sexual arousal um, begins when we take in something through one of our senses right. um, that, that we find sexually stimulating, right? Yes. And then all of a sudden, the limbic lobe kicks in. Right, that's where it all starts. This is part of the brain's reward center, uh-huh. uh, and it's activated, and uh, it says, hey, I'm sexually stimulated, so I'm going to send a neurological signal through the nervous system down to the blood vessels in the pelvic area, Yeah, and it says, open sesame, and the blood vessels open, and all this blood comes rushing in, and even better, because this wouldn't do a whole lot, the blood vessels close behind this this uh, influx of blood so the door shuts essentially yes keeping the blood well not trapped but uh, well yeah i say trapped is fine sure. okay i guess that just has a negative implication right well whether whether it's trapped or not what you got is an erect penis Right, and uh, an erection in women as well. Yeah, I was surprised to find this as well. The clitoris actually uh, goes undergoes a, a very similar process, and there you have it. So all of a sudden, you are turned on and basically ready for sex. But yes. that's not it. There's there's other physiological responses going on uh, when you're when you're sexually aroused, right? Uh, it's what I'm told. Can you fill me in on those? Yeah, I certainly can. Uh, well, your heart rate increases. Right. Um, and pleasure-producing chemicals like norepinephrine and dopamine are, are suddenly released into the brain, and it's it's go time. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that that's sexual arousal, and um, for an aphrodisiac to work, it would have to produce sexual arousal, right? Right. And it could do this in one of two ways. Correct. Through the mind. Like basically recreating that or stimulating that, right? Absolutely. And. Uh, for instance, something that might increase blood flow to your sex organs, it might simulate feelings of intercourse. So that has the effect of creating desire. Right, okay. Or it can also just go straight to the horse's mouth, right? 
so to speak. <laughs> go, go ahead. Well, it can it can create uh, increased circulation or increased circulatory flow in the genitals, and right, that's actually a, a chemical physical reaction that takes right. place. Right. The the problem is is um, as far as uh, our beloved FDA, um, Food and Drug Administration. Sure. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. I was trying to come up with a peanut butter salmonella joke, but couldn't. Right. Maybe too soon, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, they 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 don't recognize any compound, any um, any chemical at all uh, as an aphrodisiac. Right. I mean, they've done studies over the years, plenty of them, but they can't absolutely say with certainty that one thing is an aphrodisiac or not because the libido is. A, hard to define, and B, even harder to study. Well, I was also interested to find out, um, we're not entirely certain how testosterone and estrogen factor into this. Um, It turns out that, you know, we know that testosterone has an impact on sexual arousal because men who um, have trouble getting sexual, or men who have low testosterone production have trouble getting sexually aroused. So we know it factors in. We just don't quite know where. Exactly. Um, And testosterone, you know, you usually associate estrogen with women, um, but uh, testosterone has an an effect on their sexual arousal as well. Uh, Women uh, who uh, participated in a 2000 study Mm -hmm. at the University of Utrecht, um, they gave them uh, testosterone sublingually, and they found that um, genital arousal um, increased dramatically really in women with low libido yeah interesting so they it didn't they didn't report an increase in sexual arousal but you know by extension you could say you know right well i do know that testosterone therapy is something that men undergo that have a low libido yes whether it's a cream or uh, i think they have injections or if they like to get in bar fights right that's why they do that too (laughs) yes josh Okay, so the FDA doesn't recognize anything, but there's still plenty of people out there who think certain uh, foods, certain extracts, plants um, are aphrodisiacs. And this is, this is nothing new. Like some of these, no, not, these no ideas go really far back. How far back? Well, it turns out that the Persians were fairly randy folks, um, okay. the, and, and we're talking ancient Persia, um, I believe uh, pre-Kama Sutra. Which came out in, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm just going to go ahead and invite some viewer mail and say the 6th century AD, right? Okay, sure. So uh, the, the Persians were, they had one um, uh, belief uh, that honey <clears throat> was an aphrodisiac. Yeah. And apparently it has no, uh, ca- no active ingredient in it whatsoever that could produce uh, an aphrodisiac effect. Right. Um, but there is an interesting little tidbit in there, isn't there? I think you're uh, about the honeymoon? Yes. Yes, they would drink uh, honey uh, for a month after they got married, and that was called the honey month, which later became honeymoon. Is that right? Yeah, Do and if you right? go by the lunar calendar, as the ancient Persians did, then a moon from full moon to full moon is a month. So, yeah, honeymoon. And even further back, I think. Um, ancient Rome? Yeah. Well, that's not further back. It's about the same time. Yeah. They, they were big into aphrodisiacs. Um, I think uh, one of their favorites was uh, oysters, right? Yeah, oysters usually tops a list when people are going to make a top ten list of aphrodisiacs. People always put oysters at the top. Sure. And one of the reasons, oh, there's a few reasons. Um, one of the reasons is it's loaded with zinc. And uh, zinc, if you don't have enough zinc as a man, then your sperm count and your fertility are affected. Gotcha. And it also has a bunch of iron, and an iron deficiency could lead you to be too tired, which doesn't usually lend itself to, uh, to love making. No. As it were. No. And a final reason, and I think this might segue over to something else, is that uh, a lot of aphrodisiacs are phalluses. That is, they resemble a, uh, a sex organ. Which one? Uh, well, an oyster is, has been said that it resembles the female sex organ. Sure, yeah. And I know another one on the list was uh, avocados are supposedly an aphrodisiac. This, this one's my favorite, yeah. Because they, in fact, I think it's known as the testicle tree in ancient Rome <laughs> because they resemble the man's testicles. Uh, Aztecs. Aztecs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they grow in pairs and they're wrinkly. And that people considered avocados um, aphrodisiacs. Right. And that's a common theme, I know you know. Um, it's something that just resembles a sex organ. Sure. Uh, you know, carrots. 
uh, yeah. cucumbers, bananas, uh, bananas, um, figs. Figs are said to resemble uh, the female genitalia. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, all these things have long been considered across cultures sometimes uh, to be aphrodisiacs. Right. It's hard for me to think that our ancient brothers and sisters were very smart when you hear about things like this. No, they were fairly superstitious folk, I think. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds silly at this point. You know, avocados look like testicles, so if I eat them, that will make me virile. Well, e- even even more direct than that, like not they, they would also eat things that didn't just remind them of sex organs. They would actually eat sex organs of other animals. Yeah, that's the one I was a little blown away by. So, like, it makes you wonder, like, how many countless um, – and, and usually it was an animal that was known for its uh, prolific um, – uh, copulation, maybe. Right. Um, or, like you know, tiger. virility or strength. Sure. So, yeah, it, it makes you wonder how many um, countless tiger and rabbit and bull penises were eaten over the years, you know? Right. Uh, and still it goes on today. Um, there's actually, again, non FDA approved drugs outside of the U.S. that yeah. still grind up these things. Uh, I, know. I don't think anybody's dining on them any longer. No. But, um, yeah. Uh, I know ginseng was one of your favorites, right? Yeah. Um, there, I guess we should say that there are some things out there that could conceivably pr- be aphrodisiacs. They, they could produce sexual arousal, right? Right. They actually affect affect you chemically, but they, ha- yeah, they, but have they the don't chemicals. know if it's enough to actually... I think that's where the gray area is. Exactly. Like, it's there, but could it really have any right. you know, noticeable effect? Um, and one of those is ginseng. And there was a study that they... they, um, they I don't remember who conducted it, but they um, tested men... They gave them ginseng, and then Uh they tested them uh, using the uh, mean international index of erectile function, and uh, it it was shown to increase scores. So enough said. Ginseng works. There you have it. Yeah. It's it's a mood booster too, right? Yeah, I think it's an energy booster. Well, yeah. They have that ginseng up stuff. Right. Which is actually pretty tasty. Is it? Yeah. Uh, a lot of the aphrodisiacs, they say it may not be a direct like chemical correlation to your you know pelvic region, mm-hmm. but it'll do things like give you energy, and it's sort of A to B to C. If it gives you energy, then you're more likely to be aroused and in the mood for intercourse. Whereas if something saps your energy, you're going to be you know like if you eat a, a lasagna by yourself. It's probably not going to inspire you, right? To uh, unless you're Henry VIII or something, I guess. Right. Well, yeah, and you make a valid point. <clears throat> um, it's, it's just that science hates it when you jump from A to C. Exactly. You know, even if there is a, a direct correlation or right. even causation, that they really like to get that B in place first. You know. Right. Um, but yeah, so and ginseng's not the only one. There's uh, there's other, uh, like you said, uh, oysters are full of zinc and iron and other stuff, yeah. um, and chocolate actually, which is always uh-huh. associated with love and, and uh, romance. Sure, um, they, it actually has phenylethylamine uh-huh. and uh, serotonin. So these things are actually in abundance of pie, and we can ingest these things. Our right. body produces these naturally, right. but um, we can ingest them and react to them conceivably. It makes you wonder how much chocolate you'd have to eat to really get off, like perhaps like several goblets full? Josh, I think you're talking about Montezuma, who was the mm-hmm. Aztec ruler who reportedly would drink like 50 goblets of chocolate a day yeah. to increase his uh, <laughs> yeah. sexual desire. I cannot believe he died from uh, being murdered and beheaded right, rather and than, not you from know, chocolate. exploding. Right, death, death by, by chocolate. chocolate. Ooh, jinx. Uh, nicely done, Chuck. Uh, should we talk about smell? I think we should because I got to tell you, if I put stock into any um, aphrodisiac, it would have to be it would have to have something to do with smell. Yeah, it's not always food. It's not always taste. I know they say that like music and exercise can be aphrodisiacs. Sure. Well, yeah, I can tell you um, that swimming, uh, just the release of endorphins, actually is it, it, it definitely increases um, interest. Interesting. Yeah. Is that sterile enough of a word? It is. Very okay. very well done there, Josh. Thank you. Uh, if we're talking smell, um, Dr. Hirsch, Dr. Alan Hirsch. Of the Smell uh, and Taste Treatment and Research Center in Chicago. Yeah, that's a good center. Yeah. Um, he did a study that looked at different smells, and as uh, we were talking about the other day, you like to say he 
he spent a career wafting smells under men's noses to see what stimulated them. And measuring their penises. That's right. At the same time. And he found some interesting things. Um, cheese pizza, for instance, uh, increased blood flow to the penis by 5%. Uh, buttered popcorn by 9%. And then the one that really shocked me, uh, lavender and then pumpkin pie. Yeah. Actually increased blood flow by 40%. Which, that's pretty big. Yeah. You could overcome a lot of uh, sluggishness with, with that much blood infusion. Right. But that kind of, to me, in Thanksgiving was when you eat pumpkin pie a lot of times. That flies right in the face of eating turkey and watching football and stuffing your belly. Mm-hmm. And afraid. actually, pumpkin pie uh, didn't just have an effect on men. It had a big effect on women. Right. But the topper, the biggest, uh, the biggest one, uh, actually is a combination of scents that arouse oh, women. yeah. Is... A combination of the horrid and disgusting uh, black licorice flavor good and plenty candies mixed with cucumber right. smell. Yeah. It drives the women batty. Right. So long story short, I keep those things in my glove compartment. You at have all a, time. a cucumber garden in your yard? Yes. Actually, it's growing in my back seat. Wow. That's, I have nothing else to say. I don't think there is anything else to say, but I do. Actually, I do have more to say. Okay. Let's hit pheromones up real quick. Oh, yeah. This is, you're all over this. So pheromones basically have long been uh, identified as like a, a way that maybe we attract one another. Right. Remember that awesome study you told me about? I can't remember what podcast it was, but they, uh, they had women um, wearing shirts for like a week, and then they had guys smell the shirts. Right, to determine their level of attraction by smell. Right. Yeah, and it the, was right on the money. It, it, yeah, well, if, if it was right on the money, then they really lucked out because you need a, um, a, a, an uh, extrasensory organ that not all of us humans have, a uh, vemoronasal organ. Never heard of it. Okay, well, uh, basically it's like, a, it's like an addition to our, to our olfactory nerve, uh-huh. uh, our noses, basically. Right. And we can pick out packets of information from pheromones. Uh, I don't know if we can necessarily. That's never been proven. But in the animal kingdom, it's very prevalent. Uh, uh, so, and, and they pheromones are produced and em- emitted through urine, right? Right. So if your dog sprays somewhere and then an, uh, another dog comes along and just can't stop sniffing, oh, yeah. what that other dog's doing is actually determining the health uh, of the, uh, the urinating dog's um, immune system. Really? And uh, also determining if it would be a good match to produce offspring because apparently, ultimately, what you want when you uh, mate with another person, as, as far as animalistically speaking, right. um, you are looking for somebody with a, a, a compatible but opposite immune system right. so that the offspring you produce uh, has the r- resistance to the most diseases possible. Well, and the same in humans. That's what the original smell study from the other podcast right. was about. Right, right. Um, but yeah, the problem is, is not all of us have that vemoronasal organ. Uh. Um, but there was a study that, that um, what well, we emit pheromones in our sweat, by the way, uh, not our um, urine, which okay. is good for us. Yeah, yeah. Because, wow. Yeah. It'd be, we'd have a, a different society if, if that were the case. Huh? I think so, yeah. Uh, well, there was a study. It was a kind of an informal study. Um, and uh, these guys sprayed um, pheromones on one member of a set of twin girls and popped the two of them side by side at a bar on a Saturday night. Right. And w- waited to see uh, if there was a difference in which one was hit on more. Uh-huh. The one that got the boost of pheromones... Uh, was picked up three times more than her identical yet untreated twin sister. So the girl that was laced with pheromones. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. So uh, pheromones, aphrodisiacs. I feel like I've gotten a lot off my chest. Right. I know they. a lot of people believe in aphrodisiacs, but the scientific community, the FDA, as you said, does not support it. And the scientific community thinks there's also a likelihood that it just could be a placebo. If you... If you think you eat an oyster and you're going to feel a little more inspired mm-hmm. uh, sexually, then you're going to eat the oyster and feel inspired. And hey, you know what? If that, if that, Even if you're just fooling yourself, whatever. Sure. I'd say the yeah. end justifies the means in that case. Placebos work. Yeah. Well, good. Okay. Now is it listener mail time? Yes. Let's okay. get on with it. Uh, Josh, I think we are going to pull the train into Limerick Junction. Yeah, I like I like this trend. We went from haikus <laughs> to limericks. I don't know what's next. Uh, I don't know, an uh, an epic poem maybe. No, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna get the Iliad from some listener now. Uh, just a couple of limericks here. Uh, Ryan of Victoria, British Columbia, fine uh, Canadian friend. Have you ever been there? 
No. That's one of my favorite cities on the planet. I've heard it's awesome. It is awesome. It's very cool. Everybody's very friendly. It's like a tiny city with like mini skyscrapers and everything, and it's yeah. just awesome. It's British Columbia, too, so. Sure. Nice. Uh, all right. Uh, Ryan has this to say. As I wore an uncomfortable sweater, I sat down and wrote you this letter. Josh and Chuck love haikus, but haikus make me snooze because we all know that limericks are better. Yes. That's a good one, Ryan. Fantastic. And the final limerick today is from Brendan uh, Franklin of Tucson, Arizona, another cool town. Yeah. College town. Uh, the podcasting host, Josh and Chuck, and the cast that they host sure don't suck. They tell me how stuff works, and as one of the perks, I'm no, I'm no longer an ignorant schmuck. Nice. And, Brendan, we agree. You're not an ignorant schmuck. You're a good no, guy. No, you also may be the first person on the planet to ever use schmuck in a limerick. Oh, no way. No, okay. It's huge in limerick land. Is it? I'm not very familiar with them. Oh, yeah. I, I guess I should say I'm surprised that we haven't gotten uh, any dirty limericks yet, though. Although, now I think we could probably expect that. True. Yeah. I'm just happy my name rhymes with schmuck. Yeah. Well, we knew that already. Yes. So, uh, if you want to send Chuck and I a limerick, not a haiku... Um, or if you just want to say hi, or if you'd like to uh, just congratulate us on making it through how aphrodisiacs work without humiliating ourselves by cracking up, um, you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com.